everyone. Welcome to Wool and Spinning. My name is Rachel and I can be found pretty much everywhere as well for pearls. It is November 7th here in the rainy west coast of Canada. Um, I'm coming to you from just outside of Vancouver, British Columbia. And here in the Pacific Northwest, it is rainy, 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 but I will take it because I actually quite love the rain and um, I don't actually mind it. <laughs> How are you guys doing? Welcome to new viewers of the show. Welcome to this place. You are welcome here and welcome to returning viewers. If you guys could take a minute just to hit the subscribe button and the notifications button, I would really appreciate that. Thank you so much for supporting the show in that way. To patrons of the show, welcome. Welcome this morning to the live stream. Uh, for patrons of the show, for a, you know, like a dollar a month, you can participate every week in the live stream. And then the show goes public a few days later for everybody else. So welcome to patrons. Thank you so much for, for supporting the show. And to, to learn more, you can go to patreon.com slash Welford Pearls. Um, the chat is full. You guys have been chatting for quite a long time. It is so good to see everybody. Welcome. I hope that you are all doing really super well today. Um, I hope that wherever you are, that you are cozy and comfortable, maybe spinning, maybe doing some knitting, maybe some weaving. Um, drinking some fine, fine coffee, or maybe a lovely cup of tea, whatever is your thing. Um, and I hope you guys are, are doing really super well. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Mars. That's really kind of you to say. I did change the intro a little bit to stream before we start the live stream. It just gives me a minute to kind of get organized um, rather than getting into a whole bunch of like live stream countdowns and all that kind of stuff. It just gives me, gives me a minute. So thank you, Mars. That's very kind. I'm still kind of playing. I was playing around with music and stuff up until just recently. And I think I finally kind of found my groove with what I want the show to feel like and what I want um, to create in this place. So thank you, everybody. I know you guys have lots that you're chatting about in the uh, live stream. As you can see, I am wearing my Remembrance Day poppy. So here in Canada, Remembrance Day falls on November 11th. At the 11th hour of the 11th day of the 11th month, we pause for a minute, a full minute of silence to remember those who have served and gone before us. Um, I am 38. I don't know if anybody's ever guessed my age, but I just turned 38. Um, and uh, I, of all of my friends, I'm actually the only one who all four of my grandparents served in World War II. So um, Remembrance Day for us is, is a big deal. Um, and it's actually part of the reason why I grew up not having grandparents, because they were all quite a bit older by the time they had finished sort of serving immigrant, uh, my my what the one side my mom's side they emigrated to Canada after the war uh, my grandmother and my grandfather who I never knew um but of course by the time they did all of that um they were quite a bit older by the time they were having children in the 1950s and early 1960s and then of course um everybody was that much older so um yeah pros and cons, but it's unusual for my generation to have all four grandparents having served in World War II. My grandmother, um, so my mom's mom, the one that emigrated here after World War II, uh, or actually her husband emigrated here after World War II. She grew up in Canada. She was a um, Canadian Army uh, registered nurse and served in North Africa for all of World War II which is part of the reason why I grew up eating so much uh, Middle Eastern food and a lot of food that comes from Ethiopia, Turkey, um, places sort of in that sort of general vicinity of the world because that's what she ate during World War II when they were in the camps. So yeah, I was the only kid when I was a kid who knew what baba ganoush was <laughs> and uh, hummus and lentils. <laughs> So anyhow, um, we wear poppies at this time of year, and it's one of the reasons why there's a lot of Canadians who um, um, ask, like, that Christmas lights don't get turned on until November 12th. Um, a lot of people don't do it until after American Thanksgiving. Anyhow, um, yeah, there's a lot of things just to respect um, about November 11th. So that is that. Oh, Kelly. So same here, all of her grandparents and great-grandparents um, served. Aunt was in the forces. That's amazing. Lots of family in the military. My great-grandfather fought in World War I at Vimy. My grandparents were too young for World War II. Mine were a bit older too. My granddad flew Lancaster bombers and my other grandfather, who, never, who I never knew, served in World War I very young. 
and then two was injured for World War II. Wearing poppy pins is so, so nostalgic for me growing up in Canada. Marst is originally from Winnipeg, if you guys um, didn't know that. Hey Brownberry, um, she does the Hey Brownberry podcast, um, which is awesome, you guys should watch it. Um, yeah, so anyhow, that is um, why I'm wearing a poppy today. So I hope that you guys um, are doing really well. We have a packed show. I wanted to, there's a little bit of housekeeping just to update you guys on a few things that are going on more than anything. And um, I want to draw your attention to that stuff, but I also want to show you a new cast on because Nora has, I, Nora has me wrapped around her little finger and um, it's something fun. So I caved and I said yes, because apparently Santa doesn't know how to knit. Did you know that? Santa doesn't know how to knit. And um, Santa, uh, he um, apparently he's um, got arthritis in his hands. That's what Nora told me. And so he can't do the knitting. So mama, can you do the knitting and then give it to Santa and then Santa will give it to her? Seriously. <laughs> so I will share that with you guys. So in terms of housekeeping, we do have some bonus content right now on Patreon, which is available for everybody. I have linked it down below. I will link it in the live chat so that those watching later can access it too. And um, it is some extra content for our most recent breeding color studies that I did. Uh, it was, uh, we, we've, in our breeding color studies, we've been doing Charhole, and um, I did an extra how I spin vlog this time round. And so I wanted to share that with everybody. So um, it is linked there for you and you can watch. So just click on that link in the live chat and um, you can, uh, um, access that content. For those who are watching later, just remember to hit live chat replay and then you can see the live chat as you're watching this show right now. Uh, we have a couple of alongs going on in the community. There's a lot going on. So please check the show notes. They are linked down below in the show notes um, here on YouTube. And uh, if you're watching on Patreon after the fact, they're right here down below. Um, but we have the natural shades along. So this is naturally colored fleece everybody's kind of just getting their stuff together and getting organized. I think this is going to kind of be an ongoing study because this is a sort of a big project for many people. I have only just started to kind of collect my stuff and I have a couple of sweaters in mind that I would like to do to highlight the natural shades of wool. And so the link is there uh, for you if you are a Ravelry user. If you are not a Ravelry user, um, those who are part of the uh, Patreon community can use the hashtag sweater spin uh, channel on Slack and that uh, channel we are also using for our tin can knits along. I've been working on my love note. I will talk about that later in the show. Um, the thread for the tin can knits along is also in the Ravelry. It is also in the show notes for you to access that. And uh, everything is in the group on Ravelry. Um, and I try to post stuff on Instagram so that you don't miss anything for those people who don't use Ravelry. And I also post stuff on, on Patreon. So if you're not a Ravelry user and you're wanting to just kind of get up to date with stuff and wanting to know what's going on in the community, please go to Patreon and have a look because everything is listed in the index. Even if you don't have access because you're not a patron of the show, you can look at the index and see what we are doing and see if there's stuff there that might fit for you that might fit for joining us and for jumping into this amazing community. I just, you guys are amazing. Amazing. I don't know what else to describe you. Uh, book club is happening in the hashtag books, books, books channel on Slack. And we've still got our 51 yarn spin along going. So group A is finishing up next month in December and group B is going to be trucking along for another year into 2021. If you guys are uh, interested in joining group B, it's not too late. You can hop in and you can always jump in with group A and start back on your own and work your way through uh, um, on your own. So there, there's threads in Ravelry for all of that. And you guys can, can keep each other motivated as you work through your study. So let me tell you about Nora after we get into the show. So let's run the credits and I will see you on the other side.
I was just catching up on the chat. I love that you guys share so much. Um, it's wonderful. Yeah, you're absolutely right, Sarah. So U.S. Memorial Day is is a lot like Canadian Remembrance Day. And she said, I don't know why they don't just coincide date-wise. Yeah, they're just different dates. Um, yeah. So uh, let me tell you about Nora's um, crazy idea. So I was scrolling through my phone and there was a sweater that came across me. And I was actually looking at her pattern. So this is um, Megan Reagan. And I was looking at her patterns because she has, she said she's going to release it later this month, but she's designed a, um, a color work yoke that, and I think it has uh, color work all down the body as well. And it's called the pumpkin patch sweater. You might've seen it on Instagram and people have been testing it for her and it's apparently going to be released like sometime this month. So I was looking at her patterns and looking at her other stuff and she's known as Bad Wolf Girl Studios. That's her design name. Anyway, so I was scrolling through and these smartphones of ours, they are very intuitive. Children do not need to learn how to use them. They just know. So this sweater came cruising across my display and I just kept on going and Nora's like, can we go back? Can we go back? And I was like, no, no, I need to, I'm looking up something, Nora. Can we go back? Well, she got a hold of my phone later and she went back and she found it. Oh, six and a half. So this is what she found. <laughs> it's pretty adorable. So this is all we've been talking about now for 10 days. Mama. Can I have a, a unicorn sweater? Mama, can I have a unicorn sweater? Mama, please, can I have a unicorn sweater? And then she had the whole story about Santa and the arthritis and blah, 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 blah. So I went through my stash and I didn't really have the right yarn for this sweater. I didn't have enough Cascade 220. I didn't have enough uh, Barocco Vintage. Putting it all together, I didn't really have enough of it. This is a DK weight sweater. Uh, it's knit on 4.5 millimeter needles, so a light worsted works as well. So um, anything like uh, Cascade 220, Barocco Vintage, Barocco Vintage DK, all of those yarns um, will work because I wanted something that could just get used. Um, I didn't want to take the time to spin. I looked through my hand spun stash, but I didn't really have anything that would work. And I asked her if we could skip the rainbow at the top. And the only reason is because I really didn't have enough yarn to be able to do it and to do it well. And I'm not going to start buying an entire skein of yarn for two rows of knitting. So she actually said to me that she would prefer not to have the rainbow and to just have the unicorns and then the hearts. So that's what we're going to do. So I went to my local yarn shop and you guys want me to leave the photo up because it's just so freaking cute. So this is the last unicorn sweater. That's what it's called. And it's by Megan Reagan. And I will pop the link in the show notes. And as you guys know, this is not really something that I generally make. Um, but for Nora, it's what she really wanted. So I ended up going to my local yarn shop and I was looking at all the colors and everything just kind of felt flat to me. And my friend Marilyn was sort of helping me and Nothing was just sort of singing to me. Like it just didn't really feel like, yeah, that's the yarn. So I kept looking and I actually, they had several samples in the shop. Um, Cause can you believe it? I've never worked with Let Lopi. Um, I, I don't, I, I've just not, I, I work with my hand spun so much that I don't buy a lot of yarn, which you guys know. And um, I've just never ended up working with it. So I ended up in that section of the shop and I just thought, and I saw the colors and I looked and at the very bottom of the yarn display, Sue had these colors and I had other yarn in my hand that I had, that I was going to purchase. And then I saw these three colors. So let me show you these three colors. It looks like absolute and complete unicorn barf. And Nora was over the moon. She was over the moon, like, like so happy. And this bluey, purpley, silvery, pinky kind of color here, this is colorway number 1702. I just thought how perfect for the unicorns. And then she had asked for a pinky purple, really bright body of her sweater. So this is the body. This is colorway number 1412. 
And then those hearts that are underneath the unicorns are going to be in this lovely dark purple, just to add some tone and some depth, some interest. And then, you know, just the three colors together. They just scream Nora. So I actually started knitting last night because, you know, Nora told me that Santa needs the sweater. And I'm actually really impressed with A, how fast this is going, and B, how easy it is to knit. So let me take the photo away for just a moment. I know it's just so cute, but let's say goodbye. And this is um, the beginning of the unicorn. So I've worked the ribbing up at the top, which is worked on 3.75 millimeter needles. And then you work down working increases. There's several places where you work increases as you're working down the yoke. And then I've started the color work. So there's the horn. You can see the horn there. And I'm just about gonna start the mane. So the mane, I'm just gonna put the pattern up again. The mane is, is that area down <clears throat> along the unicorn's neck there. And that's actually where I am right now. I've just done the first row of that um, beginning part of the mane. So this is going to be worked all the way down. I'm actually showing you the back. This is the front. And um, I'm just going to, you know, continue to work my way down. There are some really long areas that are have quite long floats. And I probably should have caught them in my knitting. Um, I was really tired yesterday. I had a couple of really busy days this week at work, and um, which is fine. It makes the shifts go really fast. And... Um, I probably should have taken the time to catch the floats, but because it's let low pee, if I wash it in warm water, it'll stick together and it'll it'll give you that me that um that sort of felty sticky back and and once she wears it a few times, it'll get roughed up and it'll be fine. But um, I probably should have caught some of the some of the some of the uh, floats. So that is Nora's Christmas sweater. She is over the moon. She keeps coming over to me and asking me to put the, I'm doing this on my um, Addy Clicks. I love these needles. Some people don't like them because of the, um, the tips on Addy's aren't really super sharp. And some people don't like this join here. Um, it's a little bit um, bumpy. So for certain projects, I find that that my Addy's aren't, aren't the best needles, but I've always really loved Addy's. And... Um, I just, you know, yeah, they're, they're great. They're great needles. I just, I've always really liked them. I've always been very loyal to Addie. Um, they were some of the first needles that I ever made, ever used. Anyways, so she keeps coming up to me and asking to me to put the extender on the extender cable so that she can try it on bless her heart. So hopefully I will be able to work on this when she's not around and she'll kind of forget about it a little bit and then she'll be able to open it up on Christmas day. Um, this particular pattern uh, has sizes from a 19 inch chest up to a 72 inch adult chest. So there's the pattern includes a sweater, a hat, and a cowl. And um, the so there's the kids sizing and then there's the adult sizing. Um, so for Nora, I'm doing the, to her her chest is 25 inches around. So I was going to do the 28 inch chest, which is for uh, eight to 10 year olds, but the problem is it becomes too deep for her and it becomes, um, the sleeves get to be too big. So I started off the 26 inch chest and then I'm going to increase under her, um, arms to give her a little bit more room through her chest so that we'll have a little bit more, um, wear out of it for longer. So I'm sort of doing, a not really a 26, not really a 28. It's kind of right in between. It'll probably end up being like more like a 27 inch bust. Uh, which is perfect for her. She'll have lots of room to grow in it. And uh, yeah, and I'm knitting a sweater for her for, I think it ended up costing me $60. So pretty great, pretty great. Um, and really, really good for sizes. You're right, Tracy. She says, fantastic on sizes. I have a baby to knit for and her mom will love this. I can make it for a one-year-old with the smallest size. Exactly. Totally. And you know what, Tracy, it is so fast. And if you skip the rainbow, unless you have some of that yarn in your stash, um, it's even faster. Yeah, it's the issue isn't the length. Um, it's the the size of the yoke. Um, that's what I found with Nora is the, is the it's it's sort of not so much the the 
the lengths because I can adjust the lengths and I'll do the rolled cuffs Meg um, absolutely so that it gives her that added because I what I actually thought was I'll do her sleeves I'll do them longer she can roll the cuffs and then for the body I'll knit it like a tunic length so I'll just knit till I run out of yarn within reason and um, and then she'll have a tunic length sweater to start with and then she can grow up into it because most kids grow up right so she they get taller and taller and stuff gets shorter and shorter so yeah um i don't think there were any questions i think you guys were how small does yeah so and then Mer, um you guys are talking a little bit about politics i totally get it those of you who are in the states it's been a nail-biting week for you guys i've been thinking about you and um this poor kid has to wait nearly two months for her unicorn jumper i'm a big meanie <laughs> You're right, Eve. I am totally a big meanie. And you know what the funny thing is? Um, if she, um, I'm just going to pop my, my stool a bit. I'm a little bit low. Um, you know what the funny thing is? Um, I was actually thinking um, that maybe I shouldn't make her wait till Christmas and that maybe she should just have it because November can be really, really cold here. So she may end up getting it ahead of time. I Either way, I don't actually really mind. But that is that. So let's move on to other stuff. Um... Let's go to the product view. So I've got a lot of stuff going on here and I thought that I would share it all with you. So uh, we will probably, let's start with my kinfolk because um, it's been such a fun spin and it's actually very quick to talk about. I finally finished my singles for this spin. So this has been on my spindles for a very long time. I started it back in like June or something. Uh, it was right during pandemic uh, when, when everything was like, everybody was at home. We were all physically distancing. There, people were sort of just starting to talk about masks. And I spun all of this on my uh, Bosworth spindles. And I, I wound it all off this week onto the storage bobbins. Mike, help me to get it ready for plying. So the original braid was very, very um, uh, colorful. It, there was a lot of, um, let me see if I can just show it to you. Uh, it was very bright. The reds were really bright. I can't remember what it was called. I was really, I, I can't find the, the label anywhere. I feel like it was something parrot, uh, but I, I I'm really hoping that it'll just kind of show up. Um, but here are some photographs of the um, original braid and of the spinning. I just have to resize it. What I did was I took the original braid. It's been in my stash for uh, uh, quite a few years. I basically took the braid and I stripped it in half lengthwise. And I didn't uh do any other processing with it so i didn't pre-attenuate it i didn't um i didn't play with it too much i just stripped it down lengthwise and then each of those i stripped down lengthwise and the reason was because in queries and explorations which is actually meeting this afternoon uh we have been talking about uh creating yarns with really long slow color transitions and some of the different techniques that you can use to create that so one of the ways that you can do that is when you strip it lengthwise so those are the original colors aren't they amazing that red and that blue oh gorgeous kylan just does a beautiful job um one of the ways that you can do that is if you strip your braid down lengthwise through the whole length of the braid with this spin, I then stripped it again. So each of those two strips were, were spun <clears throat> end to end. So one was spun and then I spun the other one. And then the other bobbin, same thing. Um, then if you pre-attenuate, like pre-draft, so where you take the fiber and you and you pre-draft it and you, and you pull it apart before you start spinning, if you do that to within an inch of its life, like tons and tons and tons of pre-drafting, and then go to spin you can create these really long slow color transitions and um of course you create really super airy light yarns because you've pre-drafted so much and then you can spin you know continuous backward or you can spin short backward or you can spin short forward um but you create these really long slow color transitions and i thought that this colorway was perfect to do that with 
because the colors in this, I don't really want to jumble them up a ton because the more that that red and that dark red combine with that gorgeous turquoise blue, when you look at the yarn up close, you would be able to see, especially if it was like a fine three ply, you'd be able to see all the different color. But if you had, uh, but from a distance, it would look really muddy and it would look quite, um, the overall tone of it because that red is so red and the green in there is a very it's a more brown green it's a it's sort of got that more reddy yellow tone to it you would overall create a very brown dark yarn uh and so i i really wanted to see if i could by keeping the colors relatively in order if i could uh, create these long slow color transitions by just keeping the colors relatively unprocessed from how um, Kylan had originally done the dyeing. So that's sort of what I have done. And as you can see on my two bobbins here, look at all of that green that I'll be plying first. And then it'll go to all of that bluey color that you can see um, there on the bobbin. And then it'll go to that red. So I'm just really hoping that, and it's sort of a bit of an experiment, I'm hoping that the finished yarn, the colors will match up actually quite well. So that's the plan. Why does pre-drafting make color stri stripes longer? Surely if you're spinning the same thickness, there is the same amount of fiber either way. So pre-drafting just adds more air. So as long as you're not smoothing within an inch of its life um, and like, like really squeezing, um, you can create more yarn with less fiber because you've got more air in there. So I often get way more, well, not way more, but I, got, I get a significant amount of yardage more if I pre-draft. It just adds air to your fiber. It also makes a really high, a much, well, not much. I shouldn't sell it like it's so, so much more. Um, but I do find that I get more yardage. I get a higher grist. Um, my yardage just goes further. I've been wondering if there's a particular reason you wrap your yarn around the other bar of the, oh, uh, Kathleen, I have, um, Kathy, I have, I have, written an entire blog post about why I cross lace. I don't cross lace on all of my wheels and I don't cross lace all the time. Um, I do it when I can't get the right tensioning. Um, let me see if I can find my blog post on it. Cross lace. Um, I, there's, uh, there's a number of other spinners who cross lace. Um, there's lots of reasons that cross lacing is great. There's a lot of reasons why cross lacing cannot be so great. So, um, yeah, have a look at the blog post. If you still have questions, Kathy, please um, let me know. One of the reasons why I cross lace actually, to be totally honest, is I get more even filling of the bobbins. Um, I find that when you're, when you cross lace, the side of the yarn that's looped over the, uh, the arm of the flyer that then goes straight onto the bobbin, um, it kind of moves back and forth a little bit and you get this really lovely even filling and I can put more onto the bobbins and you don't get these peaks and valleys. Now I can't cross lace on my Lundrum Saxony. It doesn't seem to really like cross lacing, which is totally fine. Um, but I have also found on my Saxony that I can get much more, that the tensioning is much easier. So um, just play with it, Kathy. Yeah. Um, and also play around with the pre-drafting and, and let us know what your results end up being. Because, you know, for some people, they'll maybe pre-draft and they'll find, oh my goodness, I've pre-drafted this fiber to within an inch of its life and now it's falling apart on me. So that's where like things like distaves come in, where you can load your dist your distaff uh, and with all your pre-drafted fiber and it's all nicely organized and you're not worrying about your fiber falling apart. So Loreline, who's actually not here today, she... Uh, had pre-drafted one of Katrina, who's the dyer and one of my best friends behind Crafty Jacks. Uh, she had pre-drafted one of Katrina's roll eggs that she had ordered, and it was pre-drafted to within an inch of it of this poor roll egg's life. And of course, she was getting this amazing yarn, but she was finding that the integrity of the roll egg was falling apart, right? Because it's so beautifully pre-drafted. So what she ended up doing was loading it onto a distaff and to keep the fiber organized and to keep it uh, to keep it from sort of basically like hanging out on the floor or 
from being jumbled up in her hands or in her lap because she's constantly trying to manipulate it and move it and now it's falling apart even more and the integrity of the fiber is falling apart even more. So what Loreline has started doing is when she's pre-drafting those roll eggs out, because, you know, like those roll eggs are big. They come off the drum carter, so they're quite large compared to some of the smaller, like puni style roll eggs, for example, out of cotton. Uh, or punies, sorry, that are made from cotton. Like those are quite small, but these big wool roll eggs, they're big and there's a lot of fiber in there. So when you pre-draft them, like they, they could go all the way to the other side of the room. So she loaded it onto her distaff and she had a much, much easier time spinning. So... I'm just catching up with, oh, that's a good idea, Jenny. This sweater could be an Advent gift. That's not a bad idea, especially because Advent this year is going to be so different because we're not gathering together, right? Um, that's not a bad idea. I kind of like that. I asked James if he wanted a knitted sweater, and he looks at me, and he's like, Mom. And he never calls me Mom. He always calls me Mama. He's like, Mom, I get way too hot. <laughs> I was like, okay. Point taken. Sorry, buddy. <laughs> I was like, oh, it was so funny. Oh, good to see you, Sarah. Thank you for uh, popping in and seeing us. So that is um that project. I'm hoping to have a finished yarn for you next week, and I'll talk to you, and we'll talk about the slow transitions of color and whether or not I was able to uh, actually accomplish that or not. You know, it's funny. I am seeing in James because he's almost nine, right? I'm starting to see in him some of that, like starting to get towards that, you know, nine, 10, there's more and more things that are kind of popping up. Um, he's putting things together a lot more. Like if I do this, then this happens. If I say this, then this happens. Um, he's really like the maturity is unbelievable. Um, and then also some of the immaturity, like just boys being boys, like he doesn't sit still. He's super busy. I have to tell you guys before we go on, and then we'll talk about a couple of new cast-ons. Um, last night, we watched a movie called Over the Moon. Um, it's on Netflix. It's streaming on Netflix. At least it is here in Canada. So maybe some, maybe those of you who are in the U.S. Um, or Europe might have to be a bit creative about finding it. But I suspect that it's on Netflix in the U.S. Because most of the stuff that's on Netflix in Canada is also in the U.S. Anyways, it's called um, Over the Moon. It was written by a woman who actually has since um, died, she had cancer, and so the, the movie is in memory of her. Um, but it's about the Chinese Lunar Festival, and um, the, the Moon Festival, and it is, I, I have to admit, I did cry. Um, it is incredible. And the fusion of contemporary Chinese culture and American culture and... Um, it was, it was so well done. Um, so well done. Mike and I actually went to IMDb after the movie database, uh, and looked up like to find out like some of the nuances of it. Um, Sandra O oh does one of the voices. Her singing voice is amazing. Um, the, the, the cast is just unbelievable. The, the musical, it's a musical. I, I maybe I'll look it up really quick since we've got a couple of minutes. The way that it's described is hilarious. Uh, the genre of it. So maybe can I find it? I just want to share this with you guys. It's it's just so different from a lot of the movies that are out there. So it is a compute. It's an American Chinese computer animated musical science fantasy comedy drama film. <laughs> Say that ten times fast. Anyways, it's fantastic. I will link it in the show notes. And I hope that, um, those of you with, with kids, um, would it will enjoy, I, I hope that you'll enjoy it. It's rated G. Uh, Nora was not afraid at all. She does get a bit, a bit squirrely sometimes, but she was totally fine through the whole thing. There was nothing scary. Um, there's a hedgehog guy who I just, if I could take him home, I would, he was just so, so, so cute. So new cast-ons. Let's talk about my Montana Mountain Cowl. I cast this on on a whim because I was feeling like I needed something creative and something really fun. 
I have heard that, Zan, that 10 to 11 year old boys start to smell really awful. I have heard that, yeah. And one of the girls at work was like, she's like, I don't know what's worse, the Axe body spray or the smell itself. <laughs> um, yes, Alberto says, love, love that movie, Chang Yi. Um, definitely Carol, try, um, uh, try cross-lacing. Love this song, Ultra Luminary. Yeah, that song was amazing. Okay, you guys just have to go watch the movie. When you're spinning today, go watch that movie. Um, yeah, amazing. Best movie description ever. That's right, Megan. Your boys would love it, Megan. The other one that is fantastic at streaming on Disney Plus is Onward. Um, Mike and I both always cry at the end of that movie, but if you guys haven't seen Onward and you've got um, um, kids, uh, Nora loved it. James loved it. It was just an amazing movie. It is, um, it is a tough one um, towards the end. There, there is a like a heartfelt, but it's not corny. It's done really, really well. So this is the Montana Mountain Cowl. This is by Andrea Mowry, and I'm actually using my Halloween Rolex. So this is, I spun these last week. We talked about them extensively. I'm not worried about yardage for this cowl because I can always make more. And um, so this was the one that was the self-striping Rolex, and then I two-plied it to see what the blending and how the barber pulling would end up working out. And then this was the one that was the self-striping um, sorry, this was the blended Rolex that were, uh, the colors were all jumbled up on the blending board and they just came out crazy, crazy. And the yarn kind of came out this sort of gray brown, um, sort of slightly muddy. The sun just came out randomly. So I'm, the, the camera's blowing out a little bit cause it's just relearning the light. So in my stash, I had this, uh, Barocco, I think it's ultra alpaca light. It's in the colorway pitch black. I know that, um, which is four, two, four, five. I have had this in my stash probably since 2006, 2007. And I had two of these, but I now only have one. I'm holding the yarn double for a DK weight, yeah, DK weight-ish yarn. And this is how it's working up. So this is a mosaic pattern. I got the idea from Loreline actually. And um, I'm just really enjoying how it's working up. It's a very intuitive pattern, very easy to memorize. I haven't quite gotten to the memorization part, but I can see how it's coming. Because you're building these triangles basically. And so I've just started my third chart repeat. And basically what I'm going to do is there's a certain number of these rows of these sections of these sort of squares, if you will, these, these triangles in a square. So each of these from here to here is sort of a, a, a partial repeat of the chart. And so what I'm going to do is I have figured out from start to finish how many of these you're supposed to have in the entire cowl. And so it's a Mobius style cowl. So you block it, you finish it, block it. This is a provisional cast on down here. Um, so you finish it, you uh, block it so that it's nice and your color work is all lovely and it's all blocked and blah, blah, blah. And then you graft it together by twisting it once like you would a Mobius. And then of course it's um, worn as a cowl. So I have linked in the show notes, my project page, which will then take you to the pattern. So I will throw that in the live chat for you guys, but it is in the show notes if you don't want to take the moment now to look at it. So what I'm going to do is I've already figured out how many there are in the pattern. So I'll work half of them in this, and then I will switch to my other one and I'll do the other half in this color. So I, I think it roughly works out to like 14 and 14, something like that, or 15 and 15, something like that. So just a lot of fun. The other hindrance might be that I run out of the black, but my local yarn shop actually still has this colorway. Um, it's not in the ultra alpaca, but I could probably, but I could use one of the other. It's just so flat. Like this black is like, there's no heathering to it. It's just absolutely flat black. So I could sub another flat black in um, another sock weight yarn or it's, it's sock weight. So that's that. Just put this pattern in my queue. Mosaic is the new brioche. Yeah, it's so true. That is true, Jackie. Yeah, mosaic is the new brioche. You know what I think it is? We were talking about this in virtual spin group. I think part of it is the sheer ability to just knit so quickly. Like color work is a little bit slower because you're you've got your you know you're throwing and you're picking or your color or you're carrying two colors in one hand. However you knit. 
And then if you want to do multiple colors, of course, you're carrying multiple colors. But I think with mosaic knitting, it's just that little bit faster because slipping stitches is really fast regardless of how you knit. And for me, I feel like uh, when I have that opportunity to have those rows where you're doing, you know, knit one, slip one, knit one, slip one, knit one, slip one, and then knit, 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 and then knit one, slip one, like that type of knitting, it once you have things memorized, it gives your hand a bit of a break and it also um, gives you a bit of a mental break. And so you get this amazing result and it's interesting and keeps you going and keeps you motivated without actually um, having to sit there following a chart and being really, you know, intentional. So that is that project. The time is just trucking along. Um, the other cast on is a Mirinda shawl. So this is by Amba O'Brien. O'Brien, And I got this idea actually from my friend Lindsay of Artifacts of Appreciation. And this, I pulled out the, um, I pulled out the Perfect Blend by Casapinka. It just wasn't working for my silk sampler and I really wanted to introduce a little bit of wool into the overall um, shawl. And then Lindsay was posting about this pattern on her Instagram feed, which is at Artifacts of Appreciation. If you don't follow her, please do. She's just got beautiful photography. And so I'm using my two ply Shetland from Disdero that I had spun before I spun all of the three ply for my Albini cardigan. And I have been using, and I'm not sure what I'm going to do. So I'm, I'm sort of just leaving this up to future Rachel to make some decisions. But I have these two skeins of silk that I had spun from West Coast Color. But then I have all of my silks from my silk sampler that I did. And I have so far only been working in the natural silks with the... Um, Shetland and so doing a couple of rows of the Tassar and then the Shetland and then the White Erie and then some more Tassar and this is the um, this is the um, um, oh what was this the 5050 uh, Yak Silk um, is in there so it kind of gave me like this really gorgeous you know silk and wool look that's really natural and really neutral um because the idea is just to create something with the silks like what can we do with these yarns what um and how far can we push them and how do they work up with with wool um which is of course what most of us are working with um yeah it was just an opportunity so i just i got really inspired and i worked on this at work and then um i put it aside for nora's sweater so i will pick this back up again and it's just a mindless knit. I will link my pattern page in the live chat for you guys. And what I love about this, when, when Lindsay wears these shawls, um, she's knit quite a few of these and now she's kind of taken the shape and she started to sort of make it her own with some other um, ideas that she's had and introducing her own stitch patterns and whatnot, um, which you build it out into like a kite shape and then she wears it like a uh, triangular shawl, which of course is my favorite shape. So that is actually why I decided to give it a try because I just thought, you know, I wear that shape a lot and I really like the triangular shape. I don't like the crescent shape on me particularly. I don't wear it very often. So this is a great way to sort of broach that, um, that gap for me is, and do a different shape rather than the traditional uh, garter tab cast on. So that is that shawl. I'm really, really happy with it. Um, what ended up happening was I showed the perfect blend to virtual spin group and we all just kind of went, uh, and it just didn't sing. Like it just, I just wasn't really feeling it. And by the time you're about like yay distance into a shawl, like about this, which is where I was with the perfect blend, you know, if you're going to like it and, and want to wear it when you're done, like, you know, I didn't want to wear it. I didn't want to finish it. So I was already kind of dreading working on it. And so I just thought, you know what? Move on. Let it go and move on. So that's what I have done. Let me just have a quick look at the chat to make sure I haven't missed any um, patterns. Uh, so is Kelly's pattern available yet? Carol, you're asking. I'm actually not sure. I think Kelly can probably, that's the Engel. Um, I haven't photographed it yet, but I will get it photographed. And um I think it's supposed to be due out like this month. I think that was Kelly's uh, uh, plan. 
Um, do you feel like it's really faster though because you do twice as many rows? That's true, Rebecca. You do do twice as many rows. I think for me, yeah, that's a really good. Uh, that's a really good thought. Yeah, I've done so much color work. Mosaic is slower because I keep knitting and then unpicking. Mosaic gives a very different texture depending on if you want that that texture or not. That's true, Meg. You know, I think it's one of those situations to be honest where. One isn't better than the other, they're, but they're different. Like you say, um, Megan, they're, they're very different. It gives a very different texture. It gives a very different look because I haven't worked on it recently because I've had these other projects going on. But like my mosaic um, uh, tunic cardigan that I'm working on, like that's a very different texture and a very different look than it would have been if it was a color work uh, cardigan. So if you're not sure what I'm talking about, um, have a look at my projects page on Ravelry. It's right there. I will link it in the show notes, uh, or sorry, in the live chat for you guys. Um, my mosaic, uh, cardigan is there. So maybe it's not fair to compare. Yeah. Oh, Kelly said her pattern, her toque is going to be released next week. That's awesome. And actually Kelly, um, I, it's dry now and I'll be able to get some photographs of it and I will, um, I'll be able to share a little bit more about it next week and actually put it on for you guys. So let's talk about my Albini and my love note because I had a couple of disasters this week and they were a big bummer and they were also a really big learning opportunity. So let me just move my, um, lovely Diana front and center here. So this is my love note. It is finished. It is washed. It is blocked and it needs to get ripped out again. So story of my life, this sweater, I, I am like this close to just <laughs> like letting it go. Um, let it go. <laughs> so I added the length that I wanted to add to the bottom ribbing. And I figured out how much yarn I needed for the cast off. This is Love Note by Tin Can Knits. It is a wonderful pattern. Everything that I'm going to say is me as the knitter is the issue, not the pattern. Tin Can Knits pattern, awesome. Love Note, awesome. The problem now is that the cast off is so tight. I just did my regular cast off that I always do. And for some reason, it is so tight. Um, it is so tight that I can't even get it over top of Diana. Like I kind of have to finagle it. I have never had that happen with the bottom of a sweater before ever. Um, I don't know if it's the lack of give of this yarn. Like there's, there's not a lot of elasticity to it. It's a CVM mohair blend that I spun as a light, uh, light, light, light fingering two ply. And I held it double for this sweater, which is how I got the uh, heavy, heavy, the heavy DK light worsted. Um, and this sweater is knit on six millimeter needles. So um, gives you that really drapey, really open look. And now I've got this like really tight hem. So the ribbing is fine. It's, it's just, it's just the cast off edge. And of course the problem with that is that see how it buckles under um, and then it doesn't fall properly. So it should fall if, if, if it was done if the cast off worked properly, it would just fall and drape like this. Let me fix it so you guys can see. It would just drape and fall and it would fall like this and it would just be really lovely and open like this. But instead, when you pull it down, it kind of curls under because it's too tight and it doesn't um, fit across the back uh, properly. It fits me perfectly. Um, Mike asked a couple, he, I put it on this morning just to double check that indeed the hem was, was messed up. And he said, uh, and he's like, you know, he's like, it's not my favorite sweater. I don't love it. He's like, I don't love all of this lace. It's not my thing. He, he was being really honest. I really appreciate that about him. And he's like, but, but it's not bad. So I just sort of thought, you know, it's worth it to stick with it and to fix it. But I might ask my friend, um, Glenda, she has some of this fiber in her stash. And I might ask her if she would mind me getting a little bit from her so I could spin a little bit more so that I have enough to do a tubular cast off. So that is my plan. So Glenda, if you're watching this, <laughs> um, I'm not sure if Glenda's here today. I don't think you were in love with the love note before you even started. That is a very, very good observation. It is not my favorite, but you know, 
The problem is I feel like because I held the yarn double and because this is a really wooly wool, I'm just being really honest with you guys about this. Um, because it's such a wooly wool and because it is um, such a, and because I held it double, um, I don't know that I can rip it out. That's the problem and sort of liberate the yarn from itself. That That's actually the issue. Um, and so I sort of feel like I've constantly been putting a square peg in a round hole this whole time because it's just not really been like my thing right from the beginning. There is a part of me that kind of wonders if I should have maybe steaked it, but it's a bit too late for that because I can't really steak it now because I didn't actually put anything at the front to kind of for to be able to steak the lace. Um, I would probably have to like serge it or something down the fronts to secure all the stitches and whatnot. And to me at this point, I would rather I would rather give it away or um, give it wait until it'll fit Nora because this is the so the size that I ended up making. This is the thing. It fits me really beautifully. Um, it looks like a sweater that was made for me. Um, and the size that I ended up making actually wouldn't be terrible for Nora because I made the, so the adult extra small was a 39 inch bust. And so, and I wanted closer to a 35, 36 inch bust. And so I ended up making, can you believe this, this is so ridiculous. I ended up making the eight to 10 year old size and just adding some extra stitches in because the eight to 10 year old size is a 34.5 inch bust. So I just added in extra stitches after I divided for the raglan um, because you work the color work and then you work a few stitches of raglan. And so I just did a bunch, I, I just did extra increases in there. So it's a little bit bigger than the eight to 10. But the thing is, in a couple of years, this will fit Nora. So, Bob's your uncle. Albini. Albini has had, this is a pattern by Orlane Souche. And, oh, thank you, Glenda. Absolutely, I will send you some fiber. Thank you so much. Um, so, Albini has had um, some issues. I showed you guys Albini. Was it last week that I showed you Albini? And um, I had the pockets done. I had the lower ribbing done. The uh, bottom, um, the bottom, um, uh, the split hem at the back was done. So this is a pattern by Orlane Souche. I will link it in the show notes, or sorry, in the live chat. I keep saying show notes. Everything is linked in the show notes, but I also throw stuff into the live chat as we go. So this was done. Um, and what happened was basically in the original pattern, you work decreases in here and I had lengthened it a little bit because my torso is so long, which we've talked about a lot on the podcast, so we don't need to harp on it now, but basically, oh, and I had the button band done at the front as well. So I had finished the sweater. I was just about going to, I was just at the point where I was going to, uh, tack down the, the pockets and finish them off so that I could pick up for the lovely ribbing detail. So you work the pockets and then you pick up for this lovely ribbing detail that, that, that you then secure down that finishes that, that little, you know, detail for, for the, um, the finished look. And I put it on and I had attached, I hadn't sewn the buttons on, but I was sort of starting to get to that point where I was ready to sort of move towards finishing. I was going to finish the collar off and I put it on and Mike was like, um, do you want to look in the mirror? And I was like, oh, here we go. So there was just so much fabric in the back arm. Back here, there was so much fabric. So the sleeve was at that point down to about here. And there was just all this extra fabric. Mike figures, and he's not a sewist, and he doesn't sort of, you know, know about this stuff like we do. But he figures there was probably about 12 inches of extra fabric in here um and it was just like really bulging out at the back and i could feel it and when when i went like this like this the the cardigan was just it was too big um and i needed to work more decreases up at the top of the sleeve for it to uh fit properly otherwise this looked really big and then the other problem was because of these decreases on the side let me just move the sleeve out of the way because of these decreases on the side without increases for the hip, it meant that the measurement across the back hip was 30 inches around. Well, my hips are more like 36 inches. 
So with over six inches of negative ease across the back, I was never going to be able to button it all the way up, all the way down. Um, and it's just because of how those decreases are worked because the cardigan creates kind of like a bit of a cocoon shape. When you look at the pattern photos, and like I said, it's linked in the show notes and it's linked in the live chat there for you guys to have a look at my pattern page and that'll take you through to the pattern itself. Because when people ask me questions, they often want to know about the yarn as well. So it's all linked there. Um, when you look at the modeled photos, um, Orlaine has created this lovely kind of cocoon shape so that the cardigan kind of comes in a bit. And that's what gives the back and that divided rib back here because you it's a split hem at the back. Um, that's what gives it such a neat look. But the thing is, I want to be able to button it up. So I'm going to, so I ripped back, pulled everything out, and I'm going to do some increases through here so that I'll be able to button it up all the way down. Because one of the things I love about my Gentle Morning cardigan so much and my Williametti, uh, I never say that properly, I'm sorry, um, and a couple of my other sort of cardigan jackets that I've made, I can button them up. And so like when we're out camping or when it's cold and we're outside in the cul-de-sac, like on a day like today, this the rain has passed, it's blue skies, it's opened up. I can go out there in a cardigan and if it's buttoned up, it's nice and warm and I don't need to put on a jacket over top. So I want it to be able to button up all the way down with the added length that I added. So the finished cardigan length was uh, 15, I think it was 14, 14 and a half inches was my finished length and the pattern is 13 inches in length. So I had added an inch and a half. And Mike and I both agreed that I probably needed one more inch. So about 15 and a half inches long to make it really like the right length for my body. So out it came. So I'm back to knitting. So I did get the first sleeve done. It is done. It fits perfectly. Thank you for asking. And so the sleeve is done and I worked the braid just like you're supposed to um, on the cuff. The braid is there. It's hard to see because of the natural color and because we're a bit far away from the camera. Um, and then I'm halfway down the other sleeve and we'll get that done this week and then I can start working on the body again. And the nice thing about this is that at least the sleeves this time will be done. And so when I finish the body of the cardigan, I will be like in the last 10%, like I will be in the, in the home stretch. So I'm looking forward to that and having that done. We've had a long show today. I feel like I've done a lot of talking, but I, I hope you guys don't mind. Oh my gosh, Kelly, you are so funny. She feels awful for pressuring me to do to do the CBM, to do the love note with this yarn. You know what, Kelly? It's so funny because um, I don't feel terrible. It it was I got super excited and I was excited to make the love note and whatnot. But you know. I think um, this has been a really good opportunity for me, like looking at my sweaters that I've made already and looking at what I've got and looking at sort of what I want to make and whatnot. And um, I I think actually it's, it's really helped me to hone down on what I really want to make and what I get really excited about. And um, I actually really appreciate it as, as a learning opportunity. And I'm really glad that I took a, the opportunity to, yeah, to just make something that I wasn't sure that I was super excited about and wasn't sure that I would wear. And then um, know that trusting my gut is often the right way to go with my making. Does that make sense? Um, that's how we grow. That's how we learn. You know, I often get, um, not criticized, but I often get feedback for lack of a better word, um, for being like, um, like I'll hear this sometimes people will say, but I thought you, I thought you believed blah, blah, blah. And I'll be like, well, yeah, I did, but I don't anymore. <laughs> I, I feel like one of the ways that we can grow and one of the ways that we can, that we are constantly learning and evolving is by constantly questioning what it is that we believe and what it is that we, we think about the world around us and about the things about ourselves that we, that we think, because the more we get entrenched and the more that we dig our heels in, the harder it is to not only see the other side, but also to grow and to learn. And for me, um, 
I, my favorite thing is when I am wrong, because that means that I have learned something and that I've moved forward. It's always like, where's the opportunity? Anytime somebody says something to me, I'm always like, well, compared to what? Um, those two responses, uh, I think really help me to just really not take things too seriously for one. Um, it's just a sweater. And also to sort of apply that to life. Like, you know, you really like that, really, that's what you think. Like, like, tell me more, like get curious, you know? Um, and I think it's, it's so far, I might be wrong. It served me well. <laughs> Maybe in another 10 years, I'm like, nope, that's not how you're supposed to do things. Nope. Cause I'll have grown and learned. I don't know, <laughs> but I don't think so. Oh, I'm glad Maggie. She looks forward to the long shows. Good. Um, your discussions of ripping out have really freed me to start ripping back projects that aren't working for me. Oh, I'm glad Jenny, you know, never be afraid to rip. So it's a bit of time, you know, you, you spent that time knitting it. You enjoyed that time. That was valuable time. That was time you were investing in yourself and your making and your creativity. Um, and so it gets ripped out and you can't wear the sweater for a couple of extra days. Who cares? Like really in the grand scheme of things, it's about the knitting, you know, it's about the love of knitting. It's about the love of making yarn. It's not about making sure that you have a finished sweater every single week. Right? Right? Well, maybe it is sometimes, but not all the time. <laughs> okay. Let's do community participation. And I did see a couple of other curiosity is the best. Keep finding. Absolutely. Kathy. Yes. Um, if we can't evolve in handmade craft, especially we are lost. Absolutely. Mars. Yes. Um, I'm just checking the chat before we move on. Okay. So community participation for October, you told us about your spinning plans for the rest of the year, what you were looking forward to learning, exploring and making from random number generator from both Ravelry and YouTube out of 47 comments, number 25 won. So that was Jan badly drawn girl. And she shares my spinning plans for the next few months are to spin up some of the fiber stash that I've been dying up recently. I'm hoping to get a sweater or a cardigan in blue, green BFL and perhaps a color work yoke for another sweater. That's awesome. Jan, if you could get in touch with me and let me know your address, what I was thinking of sending you was actually some roll eggs of, I know they're Halloween and Halloween has passed, but you can put them in your stash for next year. Um, would you like some roll eggs in the blended or the self-striping, or would you like four of each? So if you could let me know, um, Jan, that would be great. And congratulations. So for November, either here or on Ravelry, tell us uh, what about your favorite items that you have made based on an emotion or a feeling. So comment on, on, on Ravelry in the episode thread for November or here on Ravelry, and I will tally up all the comments for all the November episodes. And um, we'll figure out something for November. Um, so tell us about your favorite item that you've made based on an emotion or a feeling. And this has to do with this month's 51 yarns for group A. So we'll talk about that in just a minute. Um, community participation. Queries and Explorations is going to start a little bit late today. I hope you guys don't mind. So this is San hands fun knitting sand i just think you did a beautiful job this was in her hash in the hashtag sweater spin on slack channel uh she finished her poppy sweater knitted in a yarn that she spun during tour de fleece 2020 it's durable shetland so it'll last forever she hopes it will don't worry sand it's going to be a while before my next three millimeter four strand color work project i don't blame you but it's absolutely beautiful really really beautiful and timely for us here in canada Gorgeous sand. That yoke, that yoke, you guys, that is amazing. <laughs> I want to make one, but I'm not sure I want to do a four stranded color work sweater on three millimeter needles. That's even hard to say. <laughs> um, yeah, you know what, Mars? It's true. In my experience, the frogging feeling is still better than it doesn't fit or I don't like it feeling. Yeah, it's true. Yeah. Hubby thinks I'm nuts. I will frog until I'm happy. Kathy, I am with you. Absolutely. Yeah. Is it the ribbing that doesn't fit in the love note or the cast off? The cast off, Rebecca. I did the cast off. It was too tight, which is really too bad. Yeah. Absolutely stunning. Everybody's saying, San, how much, how much they love your sweater. 
really beautiful, really well done. Good to see you, Greta. Have a great weekend. Um, so well done, Sand. Now, Christine has finished up her sweater spin for Zero to Hero. So Zero to Hero is something that we do in, in the community. It's an opportunity to go from fiber to yarn to project, and we do it sort of within the year. Um, it usually goes on into the next year. This was something that somebody, an, a community member had, had suggested year, years ago. Like we started this way back in the beginning. And it's just something we've always done ever since. So Christine shares, I finished my sweater yarn. Singles were spun on a drop spindle. Yarn was plied on her Ashford Traveler. She ended up with 1,700 meters of oatmeal BFL silk, 380 meters of amethyst BFL, and 335 meters of olive green Shetland. Beautiful. Um, grist for the oatmeal is 3,596. 1700 yards per pound so this is the thing about her grist that i'm kind of just reaming off numbers so basically what i wanted to say rather than just reeling them off is her grist for her three yarns is basically the same which is amazing so for the oatmeal it's 3500 for the bfl is 3900 and for the green it's 3500 really really consistent even spinning beautiful christine really well done that's what we're all aspiring to be able to do. I'm going to knit a yoked sweater with from the oatmeal yarn, either using the purple or the green as contrast, but we'll choose which one after I've chosen the pattern as the purple is a much higher contrast than the green. I actually think the purple and the oatmeal would look really amazing in one of Jennifer uh, Steinglass's yoked sweaters, or maybe um, Petite Knitter the um, from uh, um, the Arctic here in Canada. Her sweaters are, are awesome too. Uh, pattern contenders are at the moment are stasis, uh, Nui, branches and buds pullover or something from Jennifer Steinglass or Isabel Kramer. Beautiful. Well done, Christine. Now, Judy finished socks. This was her zero to hero. Not sure I would call this epic, but I'm happy with the spin and the finished item. I spun a braid of merino silk nylon uh, into a three strand opposing ply yarn. So that's where you spin two of your singles in your traditional. Um, direction and then the third one you spin in the direction that the yarn is going to be plied and then you ply them all in that direction so that gives you your opposing ply and um, it the the finished yarn doesn't look particularly nice like it doesn't lay like a traditional three ply yarn but the yarn the fabric is very cool my first attempt at this type of three ply and it's spinning sock yarn I feel like this yarn has come uh, has some strength to it, both with the structure and the silk nylon content. Knit toe up two at a time using the fish lips kiss heel and adding some pearl detail for fun. No real pattern followed. I just kind of made the socks up as I went, um, as I am ra a rather odd fit. Thanks for this thread. It is helping to push me to plan for projects and use my hand spun rather than stuff it in my stash. That's fantastic, Judy. I'm glad. Now for our emotional, so for November, um, our 51 yarns group A is just about finishing up their yarn. So they've got a couple of yarns left to spin. And for November, we are looking at emotional yarns. So we are looking at yarns that evoke an emotion that are based, that were made based on emotion, that are for some sort of event or feeling. Um, and Megan, I'm not going to read her poem. Um, you guys can go, you can pause or you can um, come back later and read it. Or you can look at the Ravelry thread where she posted this. But she did her 51 yarn study for her emotional yarn. And I've linked my study in the show notes as well uh, for those who have access to that. She made a yarn and a poem. And it is amazing. And I just want to say this sums up the reason why a study like 51 yarns is so important. You make all of these yarns and you become a technically more proficient spinner. You uh, explore many different structures and breeds and types of yarns, you know, plant-based yarns and wool fibers and all the different textured yarn structures. Uh, you push your wheel to its extremes. And then we also look at yarns that push the boundaries, push the boxes, make you a better spinner. And this is also... The reason for this community personified that this is a safe space to share these things, to be our real selves and to be able to go deep and to share life with each other and to do life. And so thank you, Megan, for sharing this. It brought tears to my eyes. 
and I really hope that, um, and I'm really, I'm really touched that you felt you could share this with the community because you could have just posted that you did a poem and that you did a yarn and that you, um, that, that that's what you did. You didn't have to actually share it with us. So thank you for sharing and thank you for giving us an opportunity to see, see a different side of you. Big show today. Thank you so much for being here, you guys. I really appreciate um, you being here. Thank you for spending the time with us, for coming on this fibery journey with us. Um, we all love making yarn, but we also love being together. So thank you so much for being here. If you're interested in learning more, please head to patreon.com slash Welford Pearls. Or if you want to just have a boo at the newsletter, I send it out once a month. Um, you can sign up for that at welfordpearls.com, which is the blog. I do post the show notes on the blog and also um, I try to get on there a couple of times a month to write an actual blog post because I really enjoy um, chronicling my projects and uh, keeping keeping some sort of a journal outside of Ravelry of some of the stuff that I'm working on. So if I have something to say that doesn't really fit with this kind of uh, medium, then I will post it there on the blog. So I hope that you guys have a wonderful week. I hope that you are safe and warm wherever you are, that you're holding your loved ones close and tight. Please wear your masks when you go out. It is not just for yourself to keep yourself safe. It is also to keep those around you safe. Um, if you're the more fabric that you have in that lay in a layered uh, fabric mask um, within about, I think it's um, roughly two inches of it sort of contains everything and keeps those around you safe, but it also keeps you safe. So I hope that uh, I hope that you guys are willing to do that for your neighbors. Um, what cardi am I wearing? Oh, you know what? This is actually not hand knit. Um, I bought this at a store on the side of the road in um, up on the Sunshine Coast, which is a um, uh, a location here in British Columbia, up along the coast. You have to get to it by ferry. I was with Katrina and Felicia and um, I bought it on a whim because I loved it. <laughs> it comes down to my calves. It's like super, super long and it's um, made out of uh, sustainable eco bamboo. So thank you. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, I love it. It's also very warm for bamboo. It's very warm, but I've got the window open and um, yeah, I just want it to be cozy. So thank you so much. Thank you, Diane. I really appreciate that. That's very kind of you to say. Um, thank you for being here today, you guys. I will see you next week. We have a wool circle on Friday. So for those who are part of that, um, yes, right near there, uh, Kelly. Um, um, yeah, we'll circle on Friday, so we'll have the live stream. The kids will be home, so they're gonna they have a day off school, so they're gonna be uh, watching something on their on their screens. They're super excited. And I hope you guys have a great week. Thank you so much for being here. Don't hesitate to get in touch with me this week. If you have any questions or comments or you want to just interact, I'm always here. Um, and um, I hope you guys make lots of yarn this week. Talk to you soon. Bye. Mm -hmm.